afternoon, everyone. This is Suzette Shaw with Ladies Take the Mic. Uh, we are here at Skid Row Studios in downtown L.A. today. Um, we have a uh, real life, fresh show for you all today. It's called Rude Awakening. Rude Awakening in light of our march uh, that will happen tomorrow in downtown L.A. It is um, the Black and Brown Lives United MLK Legacy March. It commemorates the 47th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And uh, we call it Rude Awakening um, because um, that was one of them. Um, that was part of the message in Dr. King's um, speech. I believe it was I Have a Dream speech, Rude Awakening. And here we are um, years and decades later, um, still dealing with a lot of the same issues and trying to move forward. So Rude Awakening, because there's a lot, there's a, uh, a real call to action um, in the community. Um, there is a um, raise of consciousness um, that we as a people are feeling and, and coming together and uniting um, as folks to deal with the issues in the community. So with that said, before me, I have uh, some folks um, who are community members and leaders that I'd like to um, go around the panel and have them introduce themselves. Why don't we start with you? Hi, my name is Guillermo Torres. I am a faith rooted organizer for Crew LA, Clergy LA to United for Economic Justice. Okay. I'm Tom Grody. I've been a Skid Row resident about a year and a half and then a downtown resident a year and a half before that. Great. Okay. And I'm Cynthia Ruff and I am an, uh, a theater activist, an organizer and a revolutionary angel. Awesome. What does that mean, a revolutionary <laughs> angel? <Cynthia? laughs> it means that, well, one, you, you get an angel, right? And all the qualities that one thinks that an angel has, right? An angel that comes down from heaven and walks the earth to help um, everyday people, you know, make change in their life. That's how I view an angel. And a revolutionary angel means an angel that's not afraid to step into the fray, right, to step yeah. right into it. You know, I feel that sometimes that... Um, there are angels that exist uh, in heaven, and then there are angels that walk the earth and to be here in human form Amen. and to move uh, positive action forward. Amen. So you're not talking about it. You're about being about it. Or you're about talking oh, yeah. about it and being okay. about it. Every way, yes. That right there. Okay, so when you say you're a theater activist, what does that mean? Well, my background in theater is, is classical theater. I was classically trained at a conservatory. Um, but when I came to Los Angeles to do my work, as so many people do flock here because it's Mecca for actors, I felt that it really the entertainment industry here was, it really wasn't speaking to me. And there was so much more that needed to happen. And I first got involved with um, theater activism, working with a company called Fringe Benefits Alliance, a company that works here in Los Angeles that's all about creating um, constructive dialogue around issues. Okay. And my first work was working with you know, street youth on Santa Monica Boulevard and okay. looking at telling their stories and turning those stories into plays, but plays that could lead to action, plays that could lead to actually speaking to people about their issues. And from there, I moved into Theater of the Oppressed and was trained by Augusta Ball. Okay, so how did you come to be involved with the uh, Skid Row community? Well, when I went back to school mm -hmm. uh, to get my bachelor's degree, I went to Antioch University okay. here in Los Angeles. And Antioch is known as a social justice university. Okay. And, you know, a lot of so they do social justice organizing. They do management, um, uh, nonprofit management for social justice organizations and so on. Okay. And there I became familiar with a program there that is a brilliant program called the Bridge Program. Mm -hmm. The Bridge is about offering free education in the humanities to people who live on the margins of society, All people right. who are low income, people who have been out of school for a long time feel that school is not for them maybe they didn't graduate school mm -hmm. maybe they got a GED but for whatever reason they don't see school or any kind of higher education as something that is for them so, so there's the, several people within the Skid Row community and uh, utilizing this program is exactly what you're okay. so a lot of people from Skid Row uh, came to to that program and I met them and just had a, a, a rude awakening mm. as to who is on Skid Row. Mm. And I really uh, became uh, inspired to and motivated and activated to want to make some difference on Skid Row. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to come back to that. Now I'm going to um, ask, um, you know, that we move back a little further and then tell if, uh, gentlemen, if each of you can tell me then how you... Um, your position in the community and 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 and, and what exactly um, you're doing currently um, that brings that resonates uh, kind of piggybacking off of what Cynthia said here. Well, my uh, most of my time and energy goes into uh, 
small nonprofits and community groups in Skid Row. Okay. So I like to be aware of what's going on the street through what they're doing and their backgrounds. And then like to try to cross pollinate and build some, uh, you know, deeper relationship and right. communication between the various groups. Right. Uh, you know, for the most part, they're focused on their mission statement or their priorities. So I'm trying to, you know, do some cross pollination. Right. Um, if I were to affiliate myself with one group, I, I would say it would be Operation Faceless Skid Row, simply because mm-hmm. when I moved downtown three years ago and then someone said, oh, you should go, you know, into Skid Row and help sweep the streets and here's the group. And okay. and so I did that and, you know, immediately got plugged in uh, through their work and then through their relationships and connections started meeting other people. All right. Um, so, but, but. What I love to do is, because I think, you know, there's multiple pieces to the puzzle and the pieces have to come together. And I I think that's one of the really powerful things that's happening Mm -hmm. right now. Um, I love to uh, get to know them better than they know them each other, even though they've been here a lot longer than I have. And then, oh, you really need to talk to so-and-so. Yeah, I've known him for eight years. Well, you need to talk to him right now. Right, right. (laughs) Well, you know, I'm going to say, Tom, that I actually, you know... um, I've been in in Skid Row a little less than two years, but I remember I see you around um, after moving to where I live now and I see you and I'd see you from afar and I don't, and then, you know, I see you sometimes, you know, come into a church or what have you. And I'm like, I was, who's that man? Who's that man? And then, you know, and you and I kind of, you know, built up a relationship over the course of the last several months. So, you know, I'm going to actually, um, you know, agree with you that, you know, in, in regards to what you're saying, because our, um, our relationship has kind of organically come about um, with, um, you know, exactly resonating off of some of the things that you're saying here. So, right. excellent. Yep. Okay. Um, and last but not least, please, Guillermo. Well, you know, uh, I like the theme that you choose today, uh, Root Awakening, mm-hmm. and then Revolutionary Angels. And I think our organizations go, the, that or, we organize the interfaith community, mostly around the issues of economic justice. Okay. And... I'm also one of the conveners of this uh, march tomorrow with uh, mm-hmm. Pastor Q, uh, one of the uh, organizations, one of the co-organizers for this event. And mm-hmm. a lot of these issues uh, from the police issues to uh, the immigrant issues and to the skid row issues go, has a lot to do also with income inequality and low right. wages. And I think, you know, I feel in my heart that for many years uh, we kind of been dormant on, on a lot of these issues. And right. now we're getting that rude awakening that uh, Martin Luther King spoke about in 1963 in his right. speech, right? That that we cannot be silenced no more and that there's a lot of wrong things in our countries. And and our job is to uh, uh, educate, organize, and move the faith communities to walk in the struggles for economic justice, but also mm-hmm. in the uh, in other struggles too, that, uh, you know, when people are being oppressed uh, a certain way, our job is to help create uh, sacred societies where everybody's right. value equal. Exactly. Where we love our neighbor as ourselves. Exactly. Now, I'm glad that you said that. Um, Tom and I were making um, uh, signs and banners for the uh, march um, yesterday evening. And um, and actually, uh, I went back again this morning. So you'll have to excuse the pain on my hands because I wasn't able to get that out. Um prior to coming here, but um, some uh, signs that I made today were, uh, se se puede, what does that mean to you? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, that's a, that's a famous quote of, uh, that goes back, I think, to Cesar Chavez, right, right. during the farm movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, it goes back also to economic justice and the way mm-hmm. they treated workers, right, because um, in uh, many in- industries uh, in the past, uh, when they started uh, maybe uh, seeing more of the profit instead of uh, the dignity of every human and the dignity of sacred labor from workers, right? From the farm workers to today we have issues, for example, airport workers, we have women's working, uh, mm. preparing kitchen uh, food for the kitchens mm. uh, at the kitchens at the airport that go into right. the airplanes that they've been working there for 17 years and they're only making $10.49 an hour. That's just crazy. Uh, we nonsense. have uh, the, McDo- the fast food campaign for uh, $15 an hour, right? And you saw mm. the recent announcement from McDonald's, right? Yeah. Which is very not enough to lift people yeah. uh, out of poverty that's affecting many other communities of yeah. color. So uh, that's, you know, when you, uh, every every time you see a movement uh, or a, an action for workers' uh, justice that are fighting for living wages and, mm. and better working conditions, you're going to hear that phrase, si se puede. Right. Now, one of our sisters in the movement, she has a car wash campaign. Um, mm. You want to, on, on her behalf, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, Rosemary, who I work, actually, I was part of that campaign, the mm. clean, uh, the clean uh, car wash campaign. Um uh, 
you know, and we were uh, probably about two years ago, uh, we saw, they saw that there was a lot of horrible conditions going on at the uh, car washes. Mm -hmm. We had workers, mostly immigrant workers, uh, um, in many cases that were not letting uh, the companies or the owners were not letting them take breaks and lunches, uh, working in extreme heat when they're drying the cars. So, and we've, we heard that in some car washes, they were... Uh, uh, only getting paid tips, not even the minimum wage. Wow! Uh, so uh, we, together with the uh, Rose, uh, the team, the campaign from uh, Clean LA, helped uh, organize and uh, help uh, join the the workers, and we helped uh, form the first union car wash in the country, which was in Santa Monica. And with the help of, right of the yeah, community, the awesome. faith community workers, uh, our union partners. Uh, and now today there's about 25 uh, car washes that are unionized. Where How is it that this happens in 2015 in the United States of America? And after Dr. King fought all these years and decades prior, and then we want to say in this country that, oh, no, we're all equal. And why are you still fussing? And why are you still fussing? Why are you still fighting? Why are you still marching? And how is it in 2015 all of this flies under the radar, yet you have all of these conservative groups that say, hey, why are you mad? Mm. I mean, how does this happen? Please, well, someone. Well, I, I just want to say that it's it's very it's very sad when you hear political leaders attacking, for example, uh, you know uh, unions uh, who are trying to keep these jobs, middle, you know, good paying jobs and stuff like that, and they still want to come after them when there's so much uh, poverty and so many uh, w low wage jobs. Right? Uh, right, a lot of jobs used to be before uh, union jobs in yeah. our country, and they still keep coming after us. It's like if like uh, if they hadn't had it, if there's not enough poverty yeah. in our country, right? Yeah. Uh, so those policies uh, have to be, uh, these policies have to change in people's mentality. They have to value people like right. they used to before right. in our country. But, but it's, it's sad that so many companies right now are, uh, are oppressing the workers by exactly. not paying them, uh, you know, the living wages that they, that they need, right, to support their families. And, it's, right. and it so happens that tomorrow's march is on uh, the start of Passover, also on Holy Week, mm, right, uh, point, which, yeah. which, expre which was an expression of freedom from slavery right. uh, for the Jewish community, right? And mm. uh, today we're not free still. Today, mm -hmm. uh, that words of Martin Luther King uh, resonates, and that's why we need this rude awakening. We need to wake up and, and really um, not stay dormant anymore. It's a travesty. It's a travesty. Now, you know, given, you know, here in America, we talk so much about, you know, if you just work hard and if you just, just you know, you're going to move ahead and you're going to, you know, what does that say about us as a country when these people are working hard for these little, little bitty dollars? They're working so hard. And yet, it's not moving them any further ahead in the sense of, you know, um, it's not moving them up on the uh, on uh, up on that pedestal or, you know, on that level of the middle class and a lower middle class and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it just really kind of reiterates that whole notion of, you know, people being one step away from, you know, um, one paycheck away from. From the street. From Skid Row. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, also, it speaks to the whole idea that we've become such an individualist mm. um, um, society, especially with the way that capitalism is going right. right now, you know, and people actually still spouting that same rhetoric of pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps. And, right. you know, a lot of people don't have boots, right. <laughs> Amen. you know, and, or, or no straps on those boots to pull Amen. themselves up, you know, by. And I think one of the things that needs to happen that like you were talking about, Guillermo, is that you know, we've got to look at the fact that what makes us common with each other is that we all have this common humanity. Right. And we really have to look at the fact that we are interdependent. Right. And the only way that we are going to survive as a human race, the only thing that's sustainable, we like to talk so much about sustainability is, right. you know, the rhetoric of, of now. Mm. What is sustainable is for us to realize that mm. we are interdependent and we need each other. You know, Nobody gets there on their own. Amen. Those are all good points. And, um, you know, it's making me think in terms of um, how, you know, in, in the workforce here in, in the United States of America, you know, we have um, the equal employment opportunity that's supposed to be equal and fair. And um, and yet it seems like the workforces and employment opportunities um, has become more like um, who's liked. It's almost like a personality contest, you know, running for, you know, homecoming queen and queen. I mean, King and queen, you know, everything is about being liked rather than equal and fair. Yet we still, you know, you got to be linked in and networking with everyone. Yet, you know, you got to know people in order to get jobs. But then they want to say, well, there's still equal and fair as far as employment opportunities. I mean, isn't that kind of redundant? 
I mean, not redundant, but isn't that counterproductive? It's contradictory. It's contradictory. Yeah. That's the word I'm looking for. It's yeah. contradictory, right? Yeah. I mean, is it not? Yes. And, and yet we act like, I mean, we just, again, I'm one of those things that just flies under the radar. I mean, you know, we act like this doesn't, everything's about being liked and linked in. Yeah. And the thing is, the interesting thing is the way that technology is moving. Technology, while it connects us to the other side of the world, it's so incredible. Mm. At the same time, it kind of serves to isolate us. A little bit you know you're talking about being liked it's all about facebook you know you've got enough likes on your page right. then you can step up into another level you right. can go up the ladder you know right. based on your likes. so right. it's interesting the, the whole idea of how we figure out how to use technology mm-hmm. now to further the movement yeah. and to find a way of c- getting back in the same room with each other, yeah. of being able to look each other in the eye and have conversations and realize that our yeah we depend and, on each other. And, you know, it kind of feeds into like, you know, the popular shows and, 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 and you know, in the pop culture, you know, as far as, you know, we've got these, um, you know, housewives of such and such and this and this and such and such. And, you know, and, and who's a popular, you know, pop person out there everything again feeds into liked i mean it's um you know and and i tell people now and uh, you know i mean i'm a grown woman so i tell people just very um matter of factly that you know i won the congeniality contest all growing up you know i'm a grown woman now i'm not trying to be a homecoming queen any longer i won all those congeniality contests when i needed to so i'm not trying to be your friend i'm about trying to tell the truth here you know i'm about Mm -hmm. about doing what i need to do to um to move forward and and the movement and 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 what needs to happen and i mean it's just like i just i get so irritated about this whole like thing everything is about pop you know being somebody's um and then it also for me as a woman and i know this is going to be part of the um conversations that we're going to have tomorrow it's about women and women's issues and equality for women um it really kind of underscores that whole um i call it the stefford wife syndrome you know that it, it underscores that whole notion of the stepford wife syndrome that you know you got to fit into this kind of kind of repressive role in order to be as a woman here in 2015 um you know i mean it's like everything is kind of it goes backwards it's like it's a counterproductive as far as we say that we're about you know when moving women forward yet there's still that undertone of keeping women submissive and repressed Mm -hmm. gentlemen i'd like to know your feelings about this (laughs) (laughs) thank you um well i mean we're talking about a march that that is based on Martin Luther King's legacy and his legacy was very inclusive Mm -hmm. and it was about raising everybody up uh, and virtually everybody on one level or another needed needs to be raised up needed to be raised up and so I think there are a variety of issues that it's like this is their moment in the spotlight yeah and uh, and certainly women's issues you know you go back with the National Organization of Women and uh, a variety of things going on uh, and maybe now is the time for the spotlight to to go back on some women's issues if they haven't really been mm. seriously looked at yeah. in a while. But uh, I mean, we're, we're a nation of immigrants, yeah. and each you know each immigrant has a story. You know, each age group has a story. Each gender right. has a story. Right. Uh, and it's and and unfortunately, we live in. I mean, you're talking about everybody wanting to be liked. We live in a very pop culture right. society. That's so, not that's not really based on listening to anybody's story, let alone go deep in it. Right. So then what does that say, Guillermo, to you as a man, um, um, you know, um, uh, an, an ethnic man and, and so forth, um, and a man, um, um, you know, you're, you're a biblical man. What does that say about, you know, as far as, um, I mean, uh, without getting too deep, but as far as on a biblical level and for you as an ethnic man and, you know, yet a man who's also part of the movement as far as moving a progressive movement, yet, you know, we still carry these roles in society where women are supposed to have a place. Mm-hmm. And how does that, what is that... Um, how does that translate to you in in the role as a man who's part of the movement, yet also how that overall fits into the world as far as how a woman is supposed to be and act in the world? Are you feeling me? Well, let me see how I answer that. Well, you know, I I I grew up in a my family when I grew up. My father, my mom. You know, it's I had a kind of dysfunctional family. I don't know if any of you have. Haven't we- I had that experience. <laughs> but, but, and sometimes it's the way we're, we're taught, the way we're grow, we grew up. Sometimes we didn't have roles in, you know, uh, like my father was 
uh, you know, he he drank a lot, and mm -hmm. my mother got mentally ill when we were only like ten years old. So, okay. Uh, so uh, at the way I grew up, you know, sometimes um, in the streets, and when I early in my childhood till about twelve, then I had my first experience with God about twelve and a half years old. Okay. Um, but I developed. It took the experience because my sister was a very accomplished uh, uh, person, woman. Okay. She's she. Um, in the, in 1980, she was going to Manny Arts High School, and she was a student body president there. Okay. I remember we were poor. Mm -hmm. and my father had thrown all the money from um, from the uh, business that he had. My mother was mentally disabled, right. and my sister was still. Uh, her, her escape was the education. Right. And she ended up um, from Manny Arts High uh, Manny Arts High School. Her and her best friend uh, Willie, who was African American. Okay. I think they both they both got scholarships to attend some of the top schools. She went to Kerman McKenna College and she spoke. She learned five languages. Awesome. And she moved to Europe and she worked with prime ministers of countries and mm -hmm. things like that. In two thousand awesome. in two thousand seven, uh, Sally, we lost my sister. We lost no, my sister to cancer. No. And it was my another. It was the second turning point in my life where mm, um, so I, uh, you know, I was taught. I was. It was like a reawakening for me because you're blaming, thinking about why God that allowed that to happen and. Mm -hmm. And she was such a kind person. She worked a lot in human rights. Originally, she was studying mm. to be a diplomat. Mm. So it opened my eyes a lot to how I look at women, how I value them, how mm. I, um, how I, uh, well, I've always valued my mom, but uh, she was mentally disabled, right? So I'm right. the I'm the caretaker of my mom, sure. uh, even though being the youngest of the family. So uh, you still see today many men um, that the way they speak about women, uh, but, you know, just by terms that they use that might. Uh, um, not value the role of a woman they also mm -hmm. by the way they, they're treated they treat them they don't see them equal sometimes and they mm -hmm. still have that mentality going back to the old uh, the dark ages right. uh, i see other cultures do that also that i hear um uh, sometimes from other cultures when uh, they they're talking to me about their their upbringing um so and then you have the the way uh women today are treated as far as in the workplace as far as their their pay they they are ones that are affected very much when it, when it uh, comes to what kind of pay they get, that exactly. they don't get the same equal pay. Exactly. And for example, when we had the campaign in Measure in, in, um, in Long Beach for the hotel workers, many of them were women of color uh, right. working at these hotels, cleaning 20 to 16 rooms. Uh, they, they got paid mostly the minimum $8 per hour after working there for many years. Right. And uh, so they were at the lower scale. So a lot of the uh you know i i my friend kathy uh, Depp, who works has an organization called nine to five but mostly works with a lot of uh women who are victims of economic justice and things awesome. like that and she says and then you know sometimes she shares the stories including immigrant uh women that work maybe on the farms and things like mm -hmm. that how they could be victims of abuse victim of uh, of uh, not only wage debt but also victims of sexual abuse and things right. like that so there is that so abortion. you know it's it's very important uh, in, in Working in my organization, which is the interfaith organization, uh, mm -hmm. my program director is Pastor Betty Roberts. She emphasized uh, that uh, every time we have an event or something like that, the importance of the role of women, and she's our mm -hmm. supervisor. So uh, you uh, learn, I learn, uh, but other you know, and to value and appreciate the role of uh, women in uh, in God's eyes, we awesome. nobody should have Lord over anybody, and, right. and that was Jesus' words that you will not be like the Gentiles telling the the. To the, the Jewish group that he was speaking to at that time, he would not be like the Gentiles that they lord over each person. No one would be lord over you. So right. uh, that is telling me how he valued every person, especially when he approached the, the Samaritan woman also. Right. And he made her the kind of the first evangelist. And sometimes we even have f uh, faith communities that don't believe in the woman as a as right. a pastor and stuff yeah. like that. And here's Jesus uh, value, uh, determining the value of a, a woman that... Uh, came to get some water and made her the first uh, evangelist. Pretty much uh, had the longest conversation uh, with her, and that's recorded in the, I think in the Bible. With uh, and so it tells you how we might. Uh, that's not Deborah. We, huh? No, this was the Good Samaritan uh, woman okay. at okay. Uh, at the uh, Jacobs uh, when he um, went to ask her for some water. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, he broke this tradition, speaking to a woman that supposedly right. had had five husbands. Right. And, oh, that's and right. Yes. Not, yes. And, and speaking to a, a rabbis were not supposed to speak to a woman in public. Here right. he is uh, going against all traditions to see how he values a, somebody. You see, right. and today we have those kind of Samaritan women today here with us. You know, whether it's a mm -hmm. single mother, the undocumented mother, uh, the mother living on skid row. Is how Jesus looks at them. That's how we have to look at them. Mm. How He values them mm. is that's those are the eyes that we have to value people with. Mm. You see, mm. equal. 
I appreciate that. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Now, um, and I appreciate you all letting me, uh, gentlemen, have this platform since this is about ladies take the mic and, you know, helping us to um, move the um, the conversations forward as far as uh, women's issues. And, and we're going to, you know, uh, move back to uh, the MLK and event um, in just a minute here. Um, but, um, Cynthia, before we go um, into break and, and, and go on to the next segment, I'd like to talk, um, you to talk in regards to the... Um, the uh, the the events and the um, the things that you're doing in the mu- in the community currently um, that stem around women's issues and women's needs and 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 so forth. Can you yeah can you speak further about yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I want to piggyback on something that Guillermo just said about mothers and motherhood. Um, there are so many mothers that are on Skid Row, mm-hmm. and we we know from uh, the Downtown Women's Center's last women's needs assessment that was done in 2013, about 30 percent, almost 30 percent of women who live on Skid Row report having children under the age of 18. Mm. And we've got a variety show coming up. DWAC, the Downtown Women's Action Coalition, has actually got a, a, fa- a variety show coming up. We do a variety show every year raising money for DWAC. And this year, our, our we're celebrating mothers, mothers on Skid Row, women who are mm-hmm. without their children, estranged from their children for whatever, for whatever reasons, mm-hmm. and women who become surrogate mothers yeah. on, on Skid Row end yeah. up being mothers to other people who are mm-hmm. on Skid Row. So I thank you for bringing up that, how much, mm-hmm. how important mothers are. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that I'm doing... Um, here on Skid Row now is I just got a, a grant from the California Humanities, uh, from Cal Humanities to um, uh, create a theater project, which is the Downtown mm-hmm. Women's Theater Project. We'll be looking at bringing together Skid Row women and non-Skid Row women who live and work in downtown to come together in dialogue mm-hmm. about how we can re-envision what's happening in Skid Row, all the change that's happening down here. I think that women have a lot of power. Yeah. And, you know, together, re-envision what downtown can actually look like and build a play around it and, and build a, a three-year theater project. Awesome. So, doing that. And then, you know, volunteering with DWAC, which is wonderful. I've got this great... Downtown Women's Action Coalition. Yeah, okay. I've got this great tea party that's coming up. We're going to have our first mm-hmm. high tea at mm-hmm. DWC. Yeah. That uh, Yvette will be... Uh, Yvette. <laughs> Suzette. <laughs> Suzette will be... Uh, will be uh, is chairing it will be a uh, hosting mm. kind of thing and that is all about just bringing yeah the idea of women's issues downtown to the fore and just i'll just end with i know you need to go to break but just to end with mm. one of the things going on right now is the story of uh, trishan carey which mostly nobody knows her name Hmm. It's very hard to find her on um, online. Now, why should that name even be familiar to us? Because she was the woman who was arrested the day that her brother Africa, Charlie Kunang, was murdered um, on Skid Row by the police on March 1st. That was March 1st, yeah. March 1st. Um, She was there as well. She was uh, with him that day. In the foreground. And the police Hmm. beat her and she was jailed and later charged with assault on a federal officer Hmm. and resisting arrest. Her bail is set at $1,085,000, which the judge refuses to reduce, stating that she is a danger to the community. Now, in actuality, she would have received better treatment had she been a white man who'd gone into a theater and mm. opened fire on everybody in there. Oh, that's deep. And that a bail set at that amount is against her human rights. And it, it and and so right now, one of the things that we're doing on Skid Row is really trying to raise awareness about what is happening with her and just to rally some support around finding and getting justice for her. And then as we extend out from there, really looking at what is happening with women on Skid Row. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, I want to talk about the overall message of um, tomorrow's march and, and kind of, um, and, and how that feeds into Brother Africa and, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the message, um, raise of consciousness is about um, can't kill Africa. You know, the, the meaning behind all of that for each and every, each of you. And, um, and we'll go to break, quick break, take a quick break, and we'll come back and deal with that. Thank you.
righty now. We are now back from break here at Ladies Take the Mic here in Skid Row Studios. We've had another member of the community join us um, since we... Um, uh, well, since we uh, were last um, before break, and I would like to introduce him now. Uh, I've got Steve Pham sitting next to me. Um, Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, who you are, uh, what your role is here in the uh, community of uh, Skid Row, and um, and as far as the uh, the movement that um, the the march is going to happen tomorrow. Oh, uh, yeah. My name is Steve Pham, and um, about seven years ago, I um, started a um, Christian community website. Uh, at that point, I wanted to uh, mobilize uh, the Christian people in Los Angeles uh, to come together and uh, basically just uh, love on the people of Los Angeles. And um, three years ago, I came down here uh, to um, actually involve in this thing called Operation Facelift Skid Row. Okay. And uh, at the time, it was um, uh, an offshoot of some, an activity that Skid Row Brigade uh, had been doing uh, for years, okay. and uh, at that point, they wanted to bring outside people to. Um, what is uh, it? What is it all about? about? Um, the Operation Facelift Skid Row is to go around Skid Row and just clean up the, the trash, and basically have a good relationship with people, talk to people, that kind wow. of stuff. And um, so, when I started, um, uh, I uh, brought up the idea like, why don't we do it every uh, Saturday and make it like a very, very. Uh, um, um, very regular thing because I okay. have tried this at my old apartment building and it did work. Uh, if you sew up and then you clean uh, on a regular basis, you actually restore something in people and they actually take ownership of the place. And so so we did that with Operation Facelift for, uh, for six months. And oh. then after that, we went out on our own. So we started with Operation Facelift uh, February of 2012. And uh, August of 2012, I have mm. my own group. And mm. um, at this point, the emphasis is mostly on cleaning up uh, the streets because at that point, Operation Facelift, uh, they wanted to have other activities like playing basketball in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I felt that we needed a more dedicated group dedicated strictly to cleaning up Skid Row. And it doesn't have to be Christian either. We want to... Uh, Basically, we just welcome the, 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 the spirit of, of helping mm -hmm. people and cleaning up the streets. So anybody from Los Angeles or anybody who can just show up uh, and uh, join us on Saturday uh, for two hours. Yeah. And so, so we start building up a storage area. We have uh, equipment and we did a lot of research into safety uh, equipment. And so it, it gradually built up uh, up to the point where uh, we make it so easy that anybody can come up come and join us and they don't have to bring anything you know we have it's amazing set up this is amazing now how many years have you been doing this um um uh, we start on our own um august of 2012. this is amazing because this really 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 just feeds into how cynthia got started on uh you weren't here at the top of the show and we were talking about um uh, Cynthia uh, identified herself as a revolutionary angel and and I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking about all of you sitting here in this room and involved in this this movement and I'm like god I've just got like just more compassion and um, love and respect for all of you because you really are you are people I mean it's just this whole the fact of how people you know, so many people talk about it. They talk about it and they talk about it. But you guys, in spite of any and every other thing, conflict or anything going on in your personal lives, you are so knee deep in it. You're on the streets of Skid Row cleaning every Saturday, brother. Every Saturday. You're cleaning these streets. Cynthia and I were actually out filming last Saturday morning and happened to bond you or you happened to bond us. And, I mean, there was a huge... Huge rat right in front of where we were filming. Yes. And, and we were like, ew. And what did you do? You came along and you There was you a big long arm thingy and just picked it up yeah, we'll and like, it up. got into uh -huh. the trash. Just, and we were like, ah. I'm telling you, it's amazing. And I, I want to add that uh, that rat uh, didn't die of, of disease because the uh, Operation Healthy ski, uh, Street, they had been uh, robbing Pellet to kill them. So it was an, uh, a disease rat. Okay. Uh, so they have been dying, but uh, because we want people to get involved with us, so sometimes we have a lot of uh, organization with women and children cleaning yeah. with us, and yeah. we did a lot of research. And uh, um, well, our policy is if we see human feces or rat, 
the the regular volunteer they don't clean it. But uh, yeah. if we have staff present and if right. if it's favorable, then we do clean it. And so we, we yeah we have procedure for everything and uh, the the the, yeah. the regular volunteer they don't touch any of that yeah. stuff. So. And I'm glad you mentioned that about the women and the children and so forth because I have to interject here that you know I was raised by a single mother. I'm I'm the sixth child of a single mother. I'm a twin. I have a twin sister who's five minutes older than me. I was raised by a community activist woman that in spite of everything, you know, she still every single day was devoted to the community, um, to the state and so forth and, and, and the greater cause of the needs of not just black folks, but, you know, people of all different ethnicities. And, um, and you know, and, and it's funny because I was actually having a conversation with some ladies on the bus or on the train the other week. And um, we were talking about, we were talking about how, um, how, you know, like as a mother or as a woman, you know, um, uh, the it's really not about the amount of time you spend with children, but it's... Um it's the quality of time, you know, you really, um, you know, um, and, and just how kids learn so much about what it means to be a community leader and be a leader. You learn so much just about what it means to be a leader just by observing others, but just by observing your parents and, and getting out and getting involved in the community, doing the things that, you know, you're talking about, you know, we have mothers and, 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 and their children who come out sometimes and support. I've, I'm involved in other things in the community, you know, mothers and, and their children come out and support, you know, I, and, and sometimes even fathers and their children come out and support but the bigger picture is the fact is that um people it's it's a beautiful thing when we talk about you know this adopt a mother campaign and tea that we're planning currently and uh, or what it means to be um a mother who is uh, adopted by others you know i mean I, 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 you know, I, I think about this right now. I had a young lady who's coming here from Arizona um, who's in her master's program and a social justice program and, you know, sent me a uh, message the other day saying, oh, Suzette, I'm coming to intern over the summer, you know, and I'm looking for housing and so forth. And, you know, in the middle of, you know, different things, you know, I'm trying to assist her with finding housing. And, you know, and I, you know, I call them all like kind of like um, my, you know, my baby kids out here. I mean, you know, they're you know, they're in the early twenties or what have you. But you know, I, I've brought no kids into the world. You know, I've never been a pregnant woman. So I just think that it's really important. Just talk about how how what lead what uh, leadership and community organizing and involvement looks like and what it feels like. And um, you know, I'm gonna move a little forward and 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 talk about the uh, the march for four four uh, tomorrow. And you know, someone actually asked me um, the other day. They said another march why do we need to do another march um what are we really marching for now i'm gonna just say personally for me i had to say to this person in a very long-winded way that um this march is the the movement the empathy you know about loyalty about you know faithfulness about family about love and about something that's a bigger and a greater cause than you it's something about something that's not even tangible. You just know that it exists and you know that people fought and sacrificed for us to do the things and be where we are here today, especially as black folks. So um, I'm going to ask um, if anybody would like to um, answer that question. What does this movement tomorrow, this March tomorrow mean for you? Who'd like to answer that question? Okay. Okay, I'll... I'll uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I've, Tom. I... If you look at history, the history of the civil rights movement or just history in general, marching is very powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, any major social movement or transformation, revolution, anything. I mean, marching is is foundational. So yeah. that, that's just an overall answer. Mm -hmm. With this march, um, there was a very long, I thought very well-researched, written article on March 30th, just a few days ago in the L.A. Times, mm -hmm that pulled the pieces together of who this guy Africa really was. Mm. You would occasionally pick up things that just seemed really strange. You robbed a bank because you had to pay for acting classes. And yeah, this is his too. name, but no, it was actually, a, he stole an identity of a friend. I mean, it was yeah, just, it was very strange. Mm -hmm. But this article really, you knew who he was. You knew the background. You knew the sadness. You knew how the system failed him. You knew how he ended up sleeping in a tent on San Pedro Street in front of Union Rescue Mission. Who was this written by? Uh, Gail Holland, who's their oh, was it LA Times? poverty okay. and homelessness uh, reporter. I have to look yeah. at that. Okay. But, and yeah, it was a wonderful article. Mm. Uh, but then the thing that really grabbed my attention was that this came out on Cesar Chavez Day. Mm. So the whole thing, you know, is, you know, black and brown lives united. Right. And here it's right here. Here's, here you are. know, an in-depth personal story about Africa mm. so that you can finally 
put the pieces together and make some sense of how he even ended up where he right. ended up and uh, telling that story of this of this man nicknamed Africa right. on Cesar Chavez day. So, so I mean, I literally saw that as a sign from God of how profound and how significant mm -hmm. this right. is tomorrow. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that because I will look for that article. Cynthia, what is it that you wanted to add to that? Well, I wanted to add that Mar what, what is that which is important about marches is that marches make us visible. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the time we feel, you know, we can slink into the background and we can talk about how we think this and thus mm. is unfair but unless we step into mm. into the fray then it's almost like we're we're, we're not even there we're not mm. visible mm. the zapatistas have this great way of covering their faces covering their faces so that they stand out from the crowd mm. you know if you look across at everyone you look and you see everybody looks the same so mm. we can see them as one big blob and 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 not pay attention but if they cover their faces then they're the ones that stand out and in that mm -hmm. way i think that taking to the streets make us visible and make right. us heard en masse and that's why it's important to keep on stepping out into the streets mm -hmm. especially when the injustice keeps on happening Ooh. so we need to keep on being seen and we need to keep on being heard right Guillermo, did you have something you want to add into that well, you know, uh, this march is very important because it continues, uh, and you said it uh, when we were working together on, on writing the press advisory, mm. race consciousness, mm. you know, uh, changes the narrative, um, uh, puts, uh, humanizes the issues out there that still exist in our country. Right. You know, these issues with what happened to Michael Brown, uh, Eric Garner, Omar Obrego, all these issues point to something more than just police mis uh, use of force, right. uh, use of force. It also points to the disparities that have existed in our communities of colors for so long because right. of past policies, right. uh, past policies that go back a long way where we were excluded from economic opportunities, right. education opportunities. And not only those, uh, there's other communities too, Asians, Jewish communities, Filipinos. Mm -hmm. um, so it speaks... Uh, uh, also that we cannot remain silent anymore, right? Uh, mm. Including the, the faith community. Mm. You know, many of our young people today are disconnected from the communities of faith because when something like this happens, we go have a vigil, we go have a, uh, a prayer, but nothing changes, right? right. So I see, it like, uh, you know, the theme of this march, Root Awakening, uh, Revolutionary Angels, all this stuff is happening for a purpose. Like, uh, like there's something going on. Right. And, and it's not only Martin Luther King not happy with what's, going, what's right. happening today. God is not happy with what's happening today, mm -hmm. right. and He's moving people to act. And, yeah. that, and that's and and this this is the voice. God is the cry. Uh, God hears the cry of the poor. Mm. God hears the cry of the oppressed. How does He reveal Himself through us, through people like us, mm. through uh, other people who are the light, uh, shining the light to these injustices? The prophetic voices going back all the way to Moses, mm. right, well, to free the uh, the Jews from the Egyptians, from uh, hard labor, from uh, bondage, right? So today there's a lot of bondage, and this march mm. will be on. On Holy Saturday, mm. uh, both uh, this this week is very holy to both Christians and Jews, right? And but it's but we're inviting everyone. It's not just uh, mm. it's, we're an interfaith community. Uh, everybody uh, who's for justice, for compassion, uh, for correcting the wrongs in our society, uh, and lifting the voices and joining the voices of yeah. other people who are oppressed. Absolutely. We're not speaking for them, but we're just joining their voices because the, uh, people have not heard them. So uh, come, you know, people should come to this march to keep uh, raising that consciousness. You know, how about, uh, about how many do you do you estimate that, you know, we'll have at the march tomorrow? Well, you know, we have a good uh, it's uh, we got a lot of good uh, we got a lot of good response to the march. Mm. It was a little bit challenge, challenging for the faith community because it's Holy Weekend mm. and some of our faith community uh, are very busy because they could do a service tonight for a good Friday. They do a service tomorrow. They do a service on Sunday. So so it's very challenging. So we're very thankful for those who encourage you who are going to come out to stand with the community. Right. Uh, and But I, we have about 40 to 50 endorsers for this march. Wow, that's quite so a few. We're getting uh, a lot of, uh, we're getting calls from the media today uh, uh, about this march. So we hope Great. it's a good turnout. But you know, but uh, nevertheless, uh, if we, if it's one voice out there, uh, that'll make the difference too. Right, <laughs> right. You know, I just thought about something, Cynthia. You design a puppet um, that depicts Brother Africa. What what compelled you to design this um, human sized puppet um, that you'll be wearing tomorrow? From what I understand, yeah, I will be. Um, it came from the idea. I used to work with a, a circus and a anarchist theater company in, in New Mexico called Wise Fool New Mexico, and they based their work on Bread and Puppet Theater Company out of Vermont. And it's the whole idea that when you know we were talking earlier, Tom, about artists coming out and 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 
putting a face on this movement and putting a, a creative face on the movement. There's one thing to go out with signs and, and, and yell loud with your mm. signs and proclaim your, 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 what's on your heart and what needs to be said. Mm. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to create spectacle. Mm. And spectacle, on the other hand, makes people stop mm. and look and say, what is that? And it's, you know, and it's the beauty of it. Okay. You know, the, the beauty of having a huge piece of artwork that really takes people's attention. And the other thing is to put a little bit more of a face on them, to humanize right, them. Right, you know, Tom, sure. you were talking about, you know, finally getting to see, get little bits of who he actually was, right. who he was as a human being before he was the dead yeah. man on Skid Row, yeah. before he was the man who... Everyone knows right. now he robbed a bank at one point. But to look back to who he was, he's in mm. African dress. Yeah. So he's in his traditional Cameroonian dress. Yeah. So we get to see who he was before right. all this happened. Right. And that was my hope with it, right. is that it would inspire right. people to see him as a human being. Right. Steve, did you want to say something? Oh, yes. Uh, I want to interject a few points. But mm -hmm. um, um, the, the whole point of me coming out is Skid Row is um, uh, basically... Um, when um, I'm doing activity in the Christian community, when I ask uh, Christian to come down to Skid Row, and it's, it's the same spirit that I'm, I'm fighting again. It's, it's almost like they sweep these people under the rug and they don't want to look at them, you know? Exactly. And they were like, why do you want to come down to Skid Row? It's right. a bunch of addicts. Right. So, so I had the hardest time inviting my church people mm. to, to come down. And, and it is against everything Christ stood for, you know. Exactly, um, I was just thinking When this. he started preaching, the first thing that he said, when well, he quoted Isaiah 61, mm. the spirit of the Lord got here upon me to preach good tidings to the poor, mm. to heal the brokenhearted. That was the first thing he said. So it doesn't matter what, what political affiliation you have. If you're mm. a Christian, you cannot get away from it. You mm. have to help the poor. You know, I mean, mm. people can have different affiliation and people can be fighting against each other, but they, ha if you're a Christian, you, you have to help the poor. And... Mm. And uh, basically, I think marching is a way for to, to, to let the world know that because, you know, like the, the people, the powerful people, they have the media. So they, they have a way to communicate to the poor or to the world. What, mm -hmm. what do the poor people have? The right. only thing to, to communicate, hey, you hurt me, it's to march to, to, to show something, right. you know. It doesn't exactly. matter. You got to show it. Exactly. And it's like, hey, some, a, a wound has been made and then it's something needs to be rectified. Well, you know, I think th I think that's really important that you say that right now is because um, one thing as far as the can't kill Africa hashtag that's been created and the whole message in regards to that resonates off of you can't kill Africa. I feel that it um, it sings to exactly what you're speaking of right now and what each and every one of you have, have laid your hands upon today um, in regards to how, you know, Africa represents each and every one of us. Um, um, and especially for those of us who live in Skid Row that are, you know, or, or have felt oppressed at some time in our lives that, you know, the, uh, Africa represents who we are as a people and who we are as an individual. Africa could have been me. Africa could have been my brother. Af you know, Africa could have been my future husband. You know what I'm saying? Africa, that's how close we are. Just like that, living the, on the edge and, you know, being one paycheck away from poverty and homelessness and so forth. And 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 then the overall a rude awakening as far as Dr. King and that overall message of, um, you know, and, and the march and how Dr. King, the marches... Um, you know, each little bit that Dr. King moved the movement forward, right? Uh, brought the brought more rays of consciousness, if you will. And so uh, I think that kind of also then leads to the bigger picture. Bobby, did you want to say something before we... Um... I just wanted to show the people... Oh, please, yes. <laughs> this is actually the flyer um, of the uh, march that we have going around. And again, it's the uh, Black and Brown Lives um, Legacy March and um, MLK Legacy March. Um, it'll be Saturday, April 4th, 2015. That is tomorrow. It starts at 3 p.m. at Olympic and Broadway. And we hope you all will come out to support. We have uh, various speakers who will be engaging the community, um, some spoken word. Um, we have some singers and so forth. And um, and. And we have a march. <laughs> it's a march. So um, don't be twisted by it. It is a march. And I would have uh, liked to have everybody come back at some point so we can continue these conversations. This is only the beginning because, again, we're talking about, you know, a movement and we're talking about a raise of consciousness. And this is just 
a beginning um, opening dialogue um, that, you know, that we'll have to continue to move forward because um, uh, we're still in it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, so, um, so we're all going to put our boots on tomorrow and, um, you know, and, and we're going to be ready to move forward and, um, and, uh, and, and stand up for what we believe in. And I appreciate each and every one of you being here with me today. I look forward to uh, having you back on the show and um, so we can continue this conversation and um, power to people power and um, Rude Awakening. Yeah. Can't kill Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.